Thanks everyone for coming. Uh, it's a real pleasure to introduce Kelly today. Kelly's a, uh, a clinical psychologist and, like me, a Adelaidean, um, and has interest in, uh, in child development and child wellbeing, and so is going to be speaking about the thesis that she's planning on doing in this domain. And I'll, I'll hand over to Kelly. Thanks, Emma. So hi everyone, my name's Kelly. Thanks for joining me for my COC presentation today. I'd like to thank my supervisors, Emma, Phil and Rich. And I'd also like to thank the panel and everyone who's contributed to the project so far. So my project is called Aspiration Orientations Across Time. Do childhood aspirations predict midlife aspirations and wellbeing? So today I'll be covering the area of research, the theoretical perspectives, my proposed studies, talking about my timeline and then finishing with questions. I will be presenting the, uh, the information in quite a specific way today and that is for the purpose of really zoning in on the critical aspects of the project. There are quite a few nuances and subsequent hypotheses that we'd like to explore. So if you do find a part of it particularly interesting or you have a particular question, I'm happy to take questions regarding that as well. Okay, so if you asked me when I was 11 years old what my aspirations were for age 25, I probably would have told you that I'd be spending a lot of my time cooking, that I'd have a cafe called Kelly's Cafe, and that I'd be balancing cafe life and family life with picking up the kids from school and I'd probably have the longest possible hair that I could have. So reflecting back on these aspirations, some of them have changed but many of them do remain the same. So if I take my aspiration for cooking for example, I remember loving cooking from a very young age and I even considered becoming a chef. But I was faced with some external factors, you might call it, such as parents or people's opinions around that choice, um, which kind of discouraged that aspiration and said that, well, maybe would you make a lot of money as a chef, you'd work long hours and you'd be working weekends, standing on your feet. And so I ended up taking the pathway of psychology. But <laughs> a little bit different. <laughs> but, um, that, that aspiration of cooking over time remained quite strong. So as I approached 30, I still had a very strong urge to spend my time cooking. And I decided to travel to Montreal to complete pastry school and went on to work with a wedding cake designer in Montreal for a little while. Um, and now I've returned to Australia. But um, I guess reflecting on that, Cooking for me continues to be an aspiration, an activity that I love to engage in. And when I think about what a meaningful life is for me, cooking is a big part of that. So I guess reflecting on my own personal experiences with aspirations, it's made me really think about that we're all faced with this task of how to construct our lives. And how do we best support people to facilitate a flourishing and meaningful life? And how do we support them from the beginning of their journey from childhood? So there's actually not a lot of uh, research on the significance of childhood aspirations. And I'd really like to know more about whether the aspirations that we have as children will affect the aspirations we have as adults and our well-being and what types of individual or parenting factors may impact our aspirations. So in order to explain how I aim to address these gaps, I'd like to first draw on the theoretical perspectives that I'll be using. First, self-determination theory, which I'll go into more detail next. Also, lifespan development, which indicates that development occurs across the entire lifespan and we can actually get a lot of really useful information by looking at the patterns of goal engagement across time. And third, the parent-child system. I identify this system as an influential system that has the potential to impact upon aspirations through mechanisms such as attachment, observational learning and parenting styles. So to take a look at self-determination theory, I'm specifically focusing on uh, one of the six mini theories called goal contents theory. 
which says not all goals are created equal, but the content of people's goals and life pursuits affects their integration and wellness. And this is because goals differ in the extent to which they satisfy our basic psychological needs of autonomy, relatedness and competency. So goal contents theory defines two main goal types. The first, intrinsic aspirations, which are said to more inherently be aligned with our basic psychological needs and include affiliation, personal growth, community involvement and physical health. Intrinsic aspirations have repeatedly been found to be associated with factors of well-being, such as vitality, self-actualisation, self-esteem, and many more. And then there's extrinsic aspirations, which are thought to be more dependent on or contingent on external factors, and they're focused more around wealth, image, and fame. And at best, they're thought to indirectly satisfy basic psychological needs. And when they're prioritised at the cost of intrinsic aspirations, they're even thought to contribute to ill-being. So these two distinctions have been repeatedly found to have a support in the literature, as well as the differential uh, relationship with well-being. But an area that is less well-researched is the stability of aspirations over time. So, for example, if we think about the period of childhood, many define this period of the life span as quite a critical period in which there's a lot of brain development and there's critical time periods. So take, for example, um, intellectual ability is said to start to stabilise around age seven, and many also think that the personality uh, traits become more stable moving forward from childhood into the life span so that you can predict perhaps someone's personality based on the traits you've seen in childhood. But we don't know whether the same is true for aspiration orientation. So for example, whether someone who is intrinsically oriented from age 11 would remain intrinsically oriented into uh, later in life. So study one will look at asp aspirations across time and specifically whether the aspiration orientations we hold at age 11 will predict our aspiration orientations at age 50. So in order to do this, I'll be using the data from a longitudinal study called the National Child Development Study. This study was conducted in Britain in 1958. Our participants were born in the same week. And when they were age 11, they were asked to write an essay about how they imagined life at age 25. So far, there has been some analysis of this data. For example, some retrospective studies that have asked participants as adults to reflect back on their aspirations as children. But there hasn't been a psychological study which has used the framework of goal contents theory to analyse the data. The other interesting component about this data set is that at age 50, participants were asked again to write about how they imagined their life, but this time to imagine what life would be like at age 60. So this gives us two points across the lifespan where participants have written about their aspirations for the future. So study one aims to first develop a method to code the qualitative data based on goal contents theory and then to analyse the stability of the aspiration orientation from age 11 to age 50. So there's approximately 7,000 participants. I'll first develop the, the method to code the data. And I'll be doing this basing on the aspirational index, which is the questionnaire which is used to measure aspirations in adolescents and adults. So I'll be using the domains from this index to base how I'll code the qualitative data for children. And the other positive of the qualitative data for children is that, that they were able to more freely speak about their aspirations in an open-ended way, rather than closed-ended questions. 
and I'll be analysing the data using regression models appropriate for count and ratio data. So I'd like to show you some examples of some essays. I've picked two essays. They're actually from the same person at two different time points. So the first essay is when this person was age 11. And I've colour coded it to highlight the areas of the domains, but I'm going to go through them just to give you an idea. So if we first look at extrinsic domains, you can see um, in the... Oh, so we've got one there for image in the green. So if you have a look at this comment here, I like buying new shoes and clothes. This would be one count for image under that extrinsic domain. Now if we look at the intrinsic domains, let's start with personal growth in the blue. Personal growth would have five counts because there's comments there including I love doing people's hair, I like knitting little things, I go to choir, I like making cakes and dinners and I go to art classes. If we look at the yellow which is affiliation, there'd be three counts there for I like making a lot of friends, I'm married, I have a baby boy. And then I think there's um, is that one more. Oh, yeah, in the red, we've got community involvement, which is I like going to church. So it would be one count there for community involvement. So, to give you an example of the possible data structures that I might be able to yield from this data, we've got the counts. And you might have been able to guess from that example that that person was relatively intrinsically oriented and 90% of their counts were oriented towards intrinsic aspirations with 10% being oriented toward extrinsic aspirations. So let's look at their second essay at time two when they were 50. So let's first look at the extrinsic counts we've got in the purple. We've got one count there under wealth as they said that they'd like to be living in a nice house. If we look at the intrinsic aspirations They've said um, for physical health that they would like good health by taking short walks. Um, affiliation in yellow, looking after the grandchildren. Community involvement, helping with my local scout group. And personal growth, going on uh, holidays and travel. So if we look at the, the stability of the orientation over time for this individual, at age 11, they were 90% oriented toward intrinsic aspiration and at time 2, at age 50, 80%. So this would be an example of a relatively stable aspiration orientation in time. So in terms of the hypothesis, um, I guess we see study 1 as more of an explorative study in that there hasn't been a lot of research on stability of aspirations over time. I am hypothesising that it will remain relatively stable between age 11 and 50, but quite open to the fact that that may not be the case, and either way, it's going to contribute to our understanding of the trajectory and stability of aspirations over time. So moving to study two, this will look at aspiration orientations and wellbeing. I'm going to be exploring whether the aspiration orientation at age 11 is linked to well-being at age 50, as well as individual and parenting factors that could impact the development of the aspiration orientations and in turn well-being. I'll be using the same data set and I'll be using um, regression analysis modeling again. So to take a look at the variables for study two, at age 50 I have a range of wellbeing variables that I've been able to pull out from the data set there. And then we've also got parenting and individual factors such as uh, parenting involvement, such as reading and playing. Parent autonomy support regarding career choice. So there's an item where parents were asked whether they felt that the child should make a specific career choice or whether that choice is up to the child, so whether they had that autonomy in making that choice regarding their career, as well as gender, SES and cognitive ability. In regards to the hypothesis for study two, based on the theory, we know that uh, intrinsic aspiring is a good thing for wellbeing, so whether someone is 
being, becoming, or remaining intrinsically oriented, we would expect that to be associated with well-being. So to show you some examples, so if we had two people age 50, one was more intrinsically oriented, we would expect them to have higher levels of well-being. If we had two people who started extrinsically oriented at age 11, but one of them became more intrinsically oriented by age 15, we'd expect them to have higher levels of well-being than those who stayed extrinsically oriented. And remaining, so if two people started intrinsically oriented, but one was to remain intrinsically oriented over time, we would expect them to have higher levels of well-being than those who uh, became more extrinsically oriented over time. And it would be really interesting to see when we compare those who remained intrinsically oriented from age 11 versus those they may have started their path more extrinsically oriented but became intrinsic, whether there's a difference in well-being there. And just to talk to a few of the possible moderators, so we know that um, females tend to be higher in intrinsic orientation than males. And some studies have shown that those lower in SES tend to have greater extrinsic aspirations. And, but I'll also be looking for the change in SES over time, so that the social mobility to see if that makes an impact on the aspiration orientation. And in regards to the parenting factors, I'm going to talk more to that in study three, but I would be expecting that parental involvement and autonomy support would be associated with more intrinsic aspiring. So to move on to study three, there's been a lot of research that's focused on what aspirations contribute to. So what are the outcomes of aspirations, but not as much on what factors contribute to the development of aspirations. And so study three is going to be focusing on parenting factors. So it'll be a narrative systematic review, and it'll be looking at any parenting factors that may foster intrinsic or extrinsic aspirations. So I'm going to be following the PRISMA guidelines and using databases ERIC and Site-Info. Two independent reviewers will assess the title and abstract and exclude uh, some of those articles. And then I'll be uh, pulling that together as a narrative synthesis. For my hypotheses for study three, I'm drawing upon a couple of areas of self-determination theory, so parenting and goal contents theory. And what I'm suspecting um, is that parenting styles characterised by autonomy, support, involvement and structure will foster intrinsic aspirations. And that's largely due to the fact that these types of parenting characteristics are associated with greater satisfaction and psychological needs. So it's promoting things like personal growth as well as like volitional engagement with aspirations. With the second hypothesis, I'm looking at the fact that parenting styles characterised by control, rejection, permissiveness will foster extrinsic aspirations. And in that regard, uh, these parenting characteristics are largely more thought to be associated with um, either like need thwarting or not satisfying some of those basic psychological needs. And that you might see a couple of things happening there which could involve perhaps children um, looking more to those external contingencies for their sense of wealth, so maybe more towards materialism or other areas to gain that sense of self. I'm also expecting there to be a range of other parenting factors that will come across in the literature, for example, a parent's own aspirations, and whether a parent bases some of their own self-esteem on their child's aspirations or performance. I'm hoping that these three studies will help to contribute to the significance or our understanding of the significance of childhood aspirations, our understanding of the trajectory of aspiration orientation over time, so we can support children's aspirational pursuits, inform parenting strategies, and ultimately promote a life of meaning and wellness. In regards to my timeline, so far I've been focusing on the development of the project. I'll be next um, starting to finalise the actual coding method so I can begin coding the essay. So that will occur for the remainder of this year 
and into early next year, hopefully around March. And then I'll be in a position to start analysing the data while I continue to write the chapters. And by my third year, I'd like to be starting the uh, systematic narrative review. So we'll finish with questions. We actually had a question to see if anyone had an opinion on this in regards to what we would best label study three. Kind of called it a narrative slash systematic review. Um, the reason for that is I'll be using the systematic guidelines to search for the articles, but I don't expect that there's going to be a lot of literature out there to really synthesise. So um, at this stage we're thinking it will be more of a narrative synthesis of the articles that we do find. So if anyone has um, yeah, an opinion or something to offer there, that would be great. But um, that's the end. Thank you.